Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Glenn Campbell, it is always a pleasure to talk with you. It's always been fun for me, too, Ian. We've been old friends. So no big surprise, though, that somehow with Glenn always comes a big backstory. And I, I love this about you, that you are always going into areas and doing things, and you've always got something going on. But you've got to have to help me right away before we even get into the story of the Colbrin Bible on uh, why I'm getting emails that says you've bootlegged the Colbrin Bible. And that uh, that this is a, a, an unauthorized Colbrin Bible or something. What's that about? The uh, the Knights, the Fraternal Order of the Knights Templar, that preserved the Colbrin Bible from the 1184 A.D. The surviving entity uh, that was dismantled in 1995 dissolved because there wasn't anybody uh, willing to take on the chivalrous code of the Knights Templar. Yes, sir. These people in 1992 sent out versions of the Colburn in all four directions in the world in order to make sure that this book was preserved and maintained. Um, there are people who would like to suggest that there are groups of people who own this particular edition or own the Colburn outright. <clears throat> Uh, that's not true. Uh, it's just a, simply a fallacy. There are copies of, or there are versions of the Colburn in Lebanon. There are, there are versions in the Vatican. There's still some in, in England. Uh, there are versions of the Colburn. Our particular version came to us as it was sent to a historian in India. Uh, and certainly this was not a pirated edition. Uh, what they're referring to basically is the fact that there was a a more uh, another version published uh, just shortly ago prior to our publication comes out of New Zealand out of the good people in New Zealand um, but it's been expensive uh, extremely expensive to purchase here okay and so we have attempted to uh, search the world to find another source for the original text which we were absolutely amazed that we found a copy of it uh, and granted to us, and we have published it here in America, in order to to fulfill the intent of this this uh, uh, surviving Knights Templar fraternity, and that was to preserve the text for the entire world. We we tend to have people who hold up the Holy Bible and say we own it, or they hold up the Nakamati text and say we are the only ones who can speak about it, or the Dead Sea Scrolls, or the Kiber Nagast, or the B Bible, or any number of different uh, ancient texts, when in reality these things uh, cannot be owned by individuals or groups. Uh, they were intended for the entire world. Well, I've totally dug reading it. Let's talk about the history of it. Let's lay it out for people that didn't read about it. The, let, let's start from the very beginning, because you believe that at least the earliest parts of this are written in what uh, biblical scholars would call the intertestamental period? Um, yes, the earliest part. We, the, the Coburn Bible... Uh, is different in the sense that it really it reads like a textbook. Uh, and it was a collection of the ancient teachings of uh, the uh, tribal you know, people of Great Britain. Uh, and it comes from many different sources. It comes from the era of, of Scota, it comes from the era of Jeremiah, it comes from the era of Joseph of Arimathea. It most certainly comes from the traditions of the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel. You know, the Saxons were are called the sons of Jacob in uh, in their most westward uh, uh, migrations. Uh, and so this, this text comes to us like an instruction manual. And maybe I can help you a little bit understand it by saying that when I was young, I read a book called The Drama of the Lost Disciples, not commonly available in America. It is available in tandem with the Coburn at the website, ancientmanuscripts.com. But in that book, uh, Joe Wett, the great British historian, suggested at the time of Jesus that the great Druids, who were called Magi by the Romans in Latin. The Latin version of the Druid in their period of time was called Magi. 
the same fraternal order that visited the birth of Christ. These Magi wise men were teaching courses of study, and Joet says there were as many as 60,000 students in these great schools. And I, you know, being kind of an investigative journalist, uh, someone who does a profiling, looking for manuscripts, you, you do a profile saying, here's where a manuscript should be, let's go look for it. Uh, I look for the, the text that was used in these great schools. It couldn't have all have been just verbal. It had to have been written down somewhere. And guess what? It was written down, and it was hidden away at the time of Edward I, or Longshanks, from Braveheart fame. Remember sure. the movie? Sure. Yeah, that would be uh, the Patrick McGowan character. Yes, exactly. Right. And, and, you know, Longshanks did a very strange thing. He invaded Wales and burnt the Glastonbury Abbey to the ground. This is historical. This is not a guess. He burnt one of the most sacred sites of Christendom in all existence. This is the place where Joseph of Arimathea was, where Jesus was rumored to have visited himself personally, where the Virgin Mary had been, where the grandmother of Jesus had visited, where Mary Magdalene and, and a, a potpourri of biblical characters beyond imagination, including the, many of the apostles themselves, had been. Longshanks did not go and burn this sacred ground, which had been operating as a, like a sovereign nation for a thousand years. He didn't burn this to the ground just to be mean. He went there to burn this to the ground looking for evidence against the Templars. The evidence contained within a document. That document was the Colbrin. All right. So help me with the narrative. So the Colbrin is written in, you know, this period right around 0 B.C., you know, give or take time on either end. It is collected in its final form by what year, do you think? I think that the final form of the collection of this Old Testament version was intact by the time just after Joseph of Arimathea in the 2nd century. So, so, so just at the beginning then of the 2nd century, maybe even late 1st century, do you think the yes. Colburn would be the uh, would be already established. Then wh what happens to it? What, how did the Knights Templar get involved? That's that's you know that's hundreds of years before the Knights Templar. That's correct. It was hundreds of years before the Knights Templar. Uh, but these schools existed for a long period of time. Out of the schools came very famous characters like Lucius Sejanus, the son of Claudius Caesar Britannicus, and of course Constantine, who was born, raised and educated in Great Britain, and knew the material that was in the Colburn Bible. Uh, these, these documents survived as a curriculum, as a course of study, and these were being taught all the way up until the time of the Crusades uh, in Great Britain. <clears throat> the, the Knights Templar took possession of these things for a, for a very specific reason. First of all, they were the protectors of the Vatican, and they considered themselves the protectors of these manuscripts as well. And they colored the, the, the documents with their own culture and traditions. So they, re, they redacted or they edited parts of this, or they added parts of it that reflected the Knights Templar point of view. They certainly did, uh, which does not diminish this firsthand uh, journalistic account of historical events. Uh, the, story of the, the story of the exodus from Egypt... Uh, that comes from Scota, who was the daughter of Ramses II or his uh, descendant, um, was a story of, the, of Moses. She was the caretaker of Moses. She took care of the baby Moses. She married a Hebrew. Her, her, her husband was, had trained his own people to be uh, mercenaries, which helped him preserve his political entity. Uh, you could not occupy ground without being invaded in those years by one country or another. So he trained his people to be mercenaries and work for the Egyptian people as the defense against the Ethiopians to the south. But they eventually went to Great Britain. And we get the country, Scotland, named after Scota. Arthur C. Clarke writes about that in his research. Really? That's I, I, exactly right. Okay, so Scotland comes 
from the name of the caretaker for Moses, the caregiver of Moses. And her story appears where? In the Colburn. It is the most magnificent independent tale of the Exodus and the time of Moses in existence in our day. What a pre- precious beyond gold. Well, uh, there's some very interesting stories that also parallel other things, other stories which even you know, non-religious people would have heard growing up, stories of creation and and stories that um, uh, are ones which we might consider to be apocryphal stories or stories from which we're supposed to learn, you know, these sort of morality tales that are in the uh, the regular Bible. But this Bible I- itself, could we look at it, the, the Colburn as, as a, as, was it considered a rival Bible? I mean, was it considered an alternative Bible or a complementary collection of works at the time? It, it certainly was never intended to be a rival. It was intended to be a curriculum course of study for the great schools, the learning schools of the common people, and the, 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 the religious or the mystical people in Great Britain. It was like a textbook, teaching them about the creation of the world. Then why suppress it? Why was it ever suppressed? It was suppressed because... Longshanks found a, a portion in the narrative of the Colburn Bible which reflected the Templar opinion. Now remember who the Templars were. The Templars, the first nine Templars, were all, without exception, members of the Fraternal Order of John, or John the Baptist. These, John the Baptist, when he grew up, he stayed the entire, his entire lifetime in Palestine. He never left. Unlike Jesus, who went after the death of his father, Joseph the Carpenter, uh, had the advantage of having his great-uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, take him on uh, uh, merchant uh, vessels and and visited many places during his life, along the silk trade routes and uh, back to the homeland of his grandmother in Great Britain, and was not located. The missing years of Jesus are missing because he wasn't there. Uh, but, But these were cousins. These were families. John the Baptist was the eldest, even though it was only by a short period of time. But after the death of Christ, the, in the Exodus of the Faithful, Joseph of Arimathea took the bones of John the Baptist back to be buried in the homeland of his mother, Elizabeth, which was Great Britain. And if you look at the histories that have been propagated on the television and, and in history books, they'll tell you that the Knights Templar were worshippers of the Beheaded One, they even worshipped the behe- uh, head. In fact, beneath the the uh, big pillar at the Roslyn Cathedral is supposedly buried this head. Or who's this head? The head is John the Baptist. It was the head. Uh, it was the reason for the uh, instigation of the use of the Jolly Roger flag or the beheaded one. And so the Knights Templar get out. Is that true? That the uh, reason why we have the Jolly Roger? That's is- correct. They all all the Templar merchant vessels flew the flag of the Jolly Roger in honor of their patron, who was John the Baptist. Now, so what we have here is we have, uh, from a perspective of the Templars, they reverenced Jesus as being a holy man, but they thought that their illustrious uh, birthright ancestor, John the Baptist, was really the antecedent for the coming of the Messiah. That's why Longshanks went to find this particular book in the Glastonbury Abbey and to destroy it, because remember the reason why the monarchs of Europe, Philip the Fair and the Pope Clement V, which lived with Philip the Fair, they went in to destroy the Knights Templar. Remember the two reasons they used to, to exterminate the Templars? It was because they spit on the cross of Christ and because they had deviant sexual practices. They didn't have deviant sexual practices. These were men whose chivalrous nature often did not allow them to marry, and so they were suspect off the bat. But the, but the first one, when they said they spit on the cross of Christ, was because they reverenced John the Baptist as a senior member of this movement over, over that of Christ, though they, re, they reverenced Jesus too. And so what, what Longshanks was trying to do was he was trying to find evidence to, to pick a fight between the Vatican and the Templars in order to do what? In order to exterminate the bank. 
The Templars were the first bank in existence right. in the world. Well, the first international bank where where you could, you know, you could invest your money on one end of the the road in the Crusades, and you could take your money out on the other end. And and Longshanks and and the uh, the uh, kings of uh, France and Spain, etc., were all heavily in debt to the Templars. And by exterminating the bank, they figured they could exterminate the debt. All right. So the the Templars hold the Colburn. Does that mean then that the Colburn was continued down in the tradition of the Templars and passed to the Masons? Exactly. Okay. So the so anybody who was uh, what a, a thirty three degree Mason, they would have already have known about the Colburn, or a degree higher than that. Yes. What do you mean? Well, I am not a I'm not of the Masonic order, but there are members who have uh, of the Scottish Rites, which once again is Templar, which is also John the Baptist territory. Um, there are higher high. There's more people in the hierarchy than just 33 degree Masons. Okay, so at some point they might have already been told about the Colburn, so it might still continue on through Masonic literature, secret Masonic literature. Exactly, and it's been it's been kept secret and uh, away from the monarchs of, of uh, Western Europe for 830 years. Well, the reason why I ask is I was curious whether then there was any proof that, say, Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or anybody else would have been exposed to the Colburn Bible. Well, let me give you a, a hint. We found, uh, I don't know if you remember the book Holy Kingdom that we discussed years ago, I think I sent you a copy. I'm not sure if I did or not. But to remember Adrian Gilbert, one of your very good guests sure. that's been on the air. like him a lot. He wrote, he wrote the book Holy Kingdom with the research of the very brilliant uh, uh, Alan Wilson, Mr. Bram. Mm -hmm. uh, they had on the cover of their book a sword, if you remember right. That sword was from the Arth Arthurian epoch of time, that, uh, from the 6th century A.D. It was found where? It was found in, on the East Coast. Hmm. And, and 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 I didn't know this until when we were looking at the sword very closely, on the blade of that sword, written in the ancient Negev, which was the original text, the language of the of the uh, Colburn. So we're just talking about how, and I'm sorry, we're getting to the very the bottom of the hour, but that that you believe that our founding father, somebody like George Washington, somebody who's a Mason, um, could have been exposed to this, even though really, I mean, very few people on the planet knew it existed then or know that it exists now? Yeah, we have two doors open, but let me make a comment about the last passage you read. Just a very short comment. The Colburn also talks about, after that period of time, the coming of Adam and Eve. And that story is so beautiful and poetic. It's probably the, the, the most brilliantly written story of Adam and Eve ever written. But it is the reason why it, this is the only religious text or historical text that forces science and creationism to sit back down at the same table and look at each other in the eyes, because this is 850 years old, and it was predates Darwin. If Darwin wouldn't have known, would have known about this, he would have felt a lot better about his divinical training. Well, I mean, but here, I mean, that whole thing about the she ape. I mean, that how how that just how did that pop up? It almost makes me feel like. Somebody wrote that now because they it reflects a sort of this modern debate. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could approve? Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if, it's, if in fact, I'm telling you, it's true <laughs> that this comes from an ancient source long before Darwin? What's the oldest living copy? We have oh, living copy. What's the oldest extant copy of a of a Colburn Bible? I mean, where we can verify, you know, this this not a copy of a copy of a copy, but I mean the oldest ex original text we can find. Well, we're talking about uh, being able to find evidence of it uh, from the from the time of Edward the First in 1184 A.D. Okay, and 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 so we're, it's 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 at least that old. Uh, it, that predates Darwin. But then we open the door too about the founding fathers. We 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 talk about this this sword that Adrian Gilbert uh, had wrote about and had on the cover of his Holy Kingdom. It shocked the devil out of me a couple of weeks ago when I realized written in this ancient Negev language, which is called Old Hebrew by many linguists, really is an Old Hebrew. It predates Eber, who was the father of Peleg and Joktan, uh, uh, Peleg being the uh, the patriarch of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joktan being the patriarch 
of a civilization that went and merged with it in, in the Orient. Uh, but uh, here we have here here we have this sword, and on the blade of that sword is written the word Colbrin in ancient Negev, and is found in Pennsylvania. And we know what Philadelphia meant to the founding fathers of this country. Right. We know, and and I we we're just in the beginnings of this investigation. You know, when they when they found the Nachamadi text. Professor Robinson didn't publish his text until 1977. That was over over 30 years after his discovery. The same thing with the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are in the very first year of publication of this text. There are so many avenues for investigation and research. Your audience gets a peek into history early. And that is wonderful. Anyway, this ancient Negev language. Yeah, wait, stop for a second. So, in the earliest version, just I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, was it in English or is it in Saxon or what's the language that the earliest known version is in? Negev. 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 Negev okay, is, and Nev- that is a dialect of what? Negev is a Middle Eastern language, like I said, was used by Eber, uh, the the patriarch of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The okay. ancient Negev is is found in petroglyphs and on every single continent in the world. It's located in petroglyphs in Arizona. It's in California. Uh, uh, Vindal Jones has found some in Texas. We find them, obviously, at our cave site in, in Illinois. This has been an amazing to me. It's because when Wayne and I first went and gathered our first few hundred rune stones from the cave, they were in this weird language, and we couldn't read it. But we found James Harris, who could read ancient Negev, and suddenly he's reading to us the stories from the cave. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. Well, you know, somebody asked me about that, too, the other day. They said, do you have an update on the, the Illinois cave excavations? Well, we, we do. We're, we're going to – we it's still in probate. And until that gets out of probate, uh, no one can get into it. And it's been in probate and had some problems with ownership for the last seven years. So, but but that's hopefully going to resolve itself this spring, and you know we have never given up. We're we're like tenacious dogs. We don't we don't we don't give up on these things. We're going to bring it to bring it to uh, coast to coast when it when we finally do it. But we've okay. we've had rune stones. We have hundreds of them that come out of the cave, and they're and many of them are written in this ancient Negev language, which for the first time we can read and understand, and they have stories on it from this same Colburn manuscript. And it's, it, the evidence is clear that these stories were once had in America. All right. So the the Negev language and these uh, these rune stones of which you speak, they would have had to have come though into those Illinois caves up the Mississippi again. We're thinking from the Egyptians. No, they would have come from the flight from uh, the Roman armies in the first century who went in and. Uh, culminated in the destruction of Masada in 73 AD. It would have been prior to that. Okay, prior to that. Okay, thank you. So uh, now, uh, back to Negev, and you were starting to say before I interrupted you. So uh, this is what we have, and this is what we can we can now, we can read this, and it's just getting the kind of exposure that it deserves. But some of the stories, I think, are the most interesting parts of this. Uh, so I want I want you to address that Adam and Eve story after the next hour. But you, before we go any further, could you go back and talk about this idea of a space threat, of an ancient warning, of a potential uh, war of some sort? Well, we know that uh, the Mayans uh, talked about a destruction of the Earth that would happen again in the year 2012. Uh, we, I know the heirs to the Inca throne, who, by the way, live in California now. Uh, I have spoken with them at length about their destruction uh, sequences at the end of the earth. For heaven's sake, Plato talked about the ultimate destructions of the earth and ushering in a thousand years of, of peace, which he called the return of Atlantis. The Christians called it the millennial era of time. Uh, the people of Mu talked about it, the return of, the, of, of Eden or Eden. Uh, or the garden, in my opinion, it was for, that's where we get the, the the terminology of the Garden of Eden. Every single culture talked about a destructive moment in time that is to come. Now you've had brilliant guests, Marshall Masters, for example, uh, has talked about this on your program. 
about uh, the coming of this destroyer, the coming of Planet X. I am, I'm not the one that probably should be the one being interviewed on that particular subject because they have done such a brilliant job of doing that. But there, someday we're going to find out the reason why they put the most expensive observatory at the South Pole because we cannot see what's coming to us from the northern hemisphere. Well, that, but what is this space threat? I mean, if, if we could... If you could just just address that, and I'll be ha- this idea of the destroyer of this catastrophic, massive red comet that orbits our sun. It's not a comet. It's a spherical, uh, planetoid-like uh, uh, entity. Okay, I was just reading off the back of your book. So they, they say massive red comet that orbits our sun, called the destroyer. Yeah, but it doesn't orbit in this in the solar plane. In other words, all of the planets uh, are in a kind of a plane, like uh, like a, a disk. This particular orbiting body is in a juxtaposition with that orbit. It's coming. It, it only comes around every so many thousands of years, and it's predicted by the Mayans to return in 2012 again. And once again, if the the brilliant thing about the Colburn is that it gives a first-hand journalistic description of the last time it came around and what happened. What happened to the earth? What happened to the people? Uh, how, how many people were destroyed? What were the events that occurred on the earth? And, because you know, the, the culprit goes into that, that there, the earth was essentially created and then recreated. I read that earlier in the hour. Do you want to tell that story of how, of how, that, supposed, how that supposedly came about? Well, you know, once again, I think that you've already had other guests. I'm not. I, I'm. I'm. I'm better at the history of the of uh, the the Exodus, etc. Uh, but yes, that what happens is that this planetoid type uh, body comes. It uh, it alters the magnetic poles. Uh, it it causes the Earth to wobble, earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, it causes some very specific uh, changes in the Earth. Uh, that mimic many things that look like uh, the plagues of Egypt. Um, if you read in the books of the Egyptians later on in the manuscript, which you probably haven't got to yet, it'll it'll talk about the specific events that occur, um, which very much are like the plagues of Egypt, where the the waters turn red, uh, uh, and that there are fish die, and that there are frogs and lice and and things that feed on the bodies of those things. Yep. Right. I'll read from Manuscripts 3 here when it says, When blood drops upon the earth, the destroyer will appear, and mountains will open up and belch forth fire and ashes. Trees will be destroyed, and all living things engulfed. Waters will be swallowed up by the land, and the seas will boil. The heavens will burn brightly and redly. There will be a copper hue over the face of the land, followed by a day of darkness. A new moon will appear and break up and fall. The people will scatter in madness. They will hear the trumpet and the battle cry of the destroyer and will seek refuge within dens of the earth. Terror will eat away their hearts and their courage will flow from them like water from a broken pitcher. They will be eaten up in the flames of wrath and consumed by the breath of the destroyer. In those days... Men will have the great book before them. Wisdom will be revealed. The few will be gathered for the stand. It is the hour of trial. The dauntless ones will survive. The stout-hearted will not go down in destruction. Remember in the book of Revelations it said the moon would turn to blood? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, this is describing the same event. Uh, uh, this, This sphere comes with it with a cloud of iron ore or uh, uh, many of the many of the comments many of the meteors that uh, have uh, an iron base and apparently there is a, a, an iron uh, debris field which is much like a comet that surrounds us but it, the difference between a comet is is it's largely ice and stone this one appears to be largely made of a heavy metal metal core with a uh, debris field of iron ore which will come out of the sky like drops of blood from the sky. It'll turn the, turn the moon to blood again. And, uh, you know, the, the two stories are intertwined like someone wrote the both texts, uh, though they obviously were written very separately by different cultures at very different right. moments in time.
So then th- this book, it, it bounces around. We know that, you know, as you said, Edward I tries to find it, destroy it, look for help him use that to help get the Knights Templar. Uh, what what happens to it after that? I mean, w- give us a, more of a timeline of what happens to the, the Colburn Bible. Well, the Templars, remember, by the time of 1307, Philip the Fair and Clement V, Clement V lived in France under the the uh, leadership or under the monarchy of Philip the Fair. Uh, they go out to destroy these Templars, who, by the way, were all original members of the fraternal order of John the Baptist, okay? Right. Now, where did they go and exit? Where did they flee to? They flee. They fled to Scotland, which is very important, because what comes out of Scotland in our day? The Scottish rites, of, uh, the, the Masonic Scottish rites. And, and many of the things that were taught in the ancient Coburn and in the, amongst the Templars were inherited, brought over to the Americas with our founding fathers. So... <clears throat> the Templars took this book to Scotland, and by the way, that's where it was preserved by a branch of the the Templars until our day, until 1992, when there were copies disseminated around the world uh, to various specific sources. Uh, before they took out a, 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 a petition for dissolution in 1995. You notice that none of the copies of the Colburn are that old. No, why? Why would they not want this shared earlier? I mean, it doesn't seem like this gives the Knights Templar any particular power. They didn't have to worry anymore about re- religious persecution. I mean, after a certain point, you know that even that doesn't happen in in England or Scotland or anywhere else. So why not just put it out there? Well, we're the first generation that would tolerate such a thing. What do you mean by that? Uh, uh, I mean, you had Nag Hammadi, you've got the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's a good time to throw well, up. That's our generation, too. Yeah, but I mean, that's that's a good time to throw out the Colburn Bible. Do you know how many movements are still in America who believe that Gnostics were evil, wicked men, that were the dross of the earth, and the Gnostics being the authors of the, of the Nag Hammadi Library itself? I mean, if the Nag Hammadi Library would have been founded... Uh, I found uh, at the time of the founding fathers, they would have killed them. Uh, they would. It, it, just after the time of the of the Templars. Now remember that this ushered in the Spanish Inquisition. Well, this, I get, but I get why they wouldn't mention it at the times of the Spanish Inquisition. That's totally fair. But you would think, really, from I don't know, eighteen fifty forward or something like that, you could you could have released something like this, and and nothing bad would have happened to you. Well, you you get 800 years of uh, of hiding a document under okay. your belt. You yeah. Get, you get used to hiding it. And you Force look for of habit. To bring it about. Right, okay. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.